a lot of time I've spent over the last three weeks has been talking to landlords and tenants uh, who have said, well, so I understand we don't have to pay rent. And my answer is, no one said you don't have to pay rent. What they said is no evictions. And about half the people say, oh, I get it. And the other half of the people say, well, what's the difference? Hi, this is Chris German from The Apartment Dealer. Welcome back to The Apartment Dealer Show. This is where we bring you the resources, strategies, and the network of professionals that can help you in the ownership and management of your multifamily properties. With me today is Mr. Steven Spear. Steve has been practicing real estate law for more than 40 years now and impressively has ownership in more than 2,000 units, both inside and outside the state. Steve was with us a little over two weeks ago at our live educational webinar, which typically is slated to be a live uh, educational luncheon. But given the COVID-19 issue, we hosted it via webinar. And since then, there's been many updates, uh, particular to the eviction of tenants. We wanted to have Steve back, have him weigh in on what has transpired in the last two weeks and have him uh, share with us his thoughts on as he sits both in the uh, lawyer's office and in the management office, so to speak, understanding both avenues. What can landlords do to protect themselves? How do they navigate these waters? How do they not end up in a financial hardship because they are unable to navigate how to collect rents when the courts are protecting tenants from evictions? So we have a lot to unpack today. Steve, thank you for being with us. Chris, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It is a new day under this uh, stay-at-home order, and I hope you and your family are faring well and making the, the best of these times. We're, we're certainly trying, and it's, uh, it's a very unusual life for us as it is for everyone. Uh, I, we send our best wishes uh, for safety and health for, for all of you. Now, when we were together at the educational webinar, at that time, people were already up in arms because Governor Gavin Newsom had issued a 90-day moratorium on evictions. And since then, as late of last week, the uh, Judicial Assembly, I believe it is, correct me if I'm wrong, Judicial Council, essentially comes out and says, well, there's going to be no evictions, and that order is going to last 90 days until Gavin Newsom lifts the stay-at-home order. So can you unpack this for us, help us make some sense of what happened last week? Well, first of all, it's not clear what any of it means, and no one really knows, and that's really the bottom line here. The one reason no one knows is because it's changing still on an hourly basis, and we're hearing different things from uh, the federal government, different things from the state government. We may hear yet other things from the counties and from the cities. And so you have conflicting authorities. So that's the second problem. And then the third problem is we don't know what the facts are that are going to develop on the ground, either with the virus or with the economy. So, so that's the first thing. So when Governor Newsom says that there won't be any evictions for 90 days from the lift of the stay, what does the lift of the stay mean? Is there going to be a proclamation date when he says this is the lift of the stay? Or is it going to be phased? And if it is phased, will those 90 days begin at the beginning of the phasing or at the second piece, or the third piece? So we don't know. We also don't know if the 90 days will be 90 days because it may turn out there are other problems that are created by that. And as a result, that 90 days may get shorter or it may get longer. So we have to start from the presumption that we mostly don't know what is going to happen and we have to respond instead to the facts on the ground as they are. And so one of the things that has happened is all evictions and all foreclosures have been stopped. So when we start with uh, the government saying there won't be evictions, and this was said by the mayor of Los Angeles, or the city of Los Angeles on behalf of the city and the county, it was said by Gavin Newsom on behalf of the state of California, and it was said by the president on behalf of the whole country. No evictions, no foreclosures. Well, a lot of time I've spent over the last three weeks has been talking to landlords 
and tenants uh, who have said, well, so I understand we don't have to pay rent. And my answer is, no one said you don't have to pay rent. What they said is no evictions. And about half the people say, oh, I get it. And the other half of the people say, well, what's the difference? Or isn't that the same thing? It's not the same thing. No evictions doesn't mean the rent isn't owed. The rent is owed. And the question is, do, does the rent get paid? Eventually, the answer is sure, because there's a lease that says so, a contract that says so, the law that says so, and the tenant is enjoying the peaceful possession of their premises. So the tenant is going to owe the rent. The question then becomes, if you don't have to pay, if, if you think you don't have to pay the rent, what do you do? Well, a lot of people won't pay the rent because, wow, free money. And other people are, have the money, but they're afraid to pay the rent because they think if I pay the rent, I won't have money for food. We have people in food lines now that are arranging seven to 11 hours where they run out of food at the eighth hour and the people in the last three hours of the line don't get any food and are told come back tomorrow. And these are people, many of whom have never been on, on government aid and never thought they would have to stand in the line to get a can of soup and yet they are. So we're in uncharted territory here. So what happens is what, what landlords need to do is to be in direct communication with tenants to find out, can you pay the rent? If you can't pay all the rent, can you pay some of the rent? If you're able to pay the rent, but you don't want to pay the rent because you're afraid, that's a different story. And if you don't have the money to pay the rent at all, that's yet another story. So what landlords need to do is have direct communication, not by text, not by email, not in person because of social distancing, but by telephone or Skype or Zoom or something electronic where you can have a conversation with your tenants. And if you have a uh, resident manager, the resident manager is the person doing this. If you are managing the property yourself, you're the one doing this. And you have direct communication and you say first, how are you, how are you doing? How are you holding up under all this? And then you say, we're all gonna get through this and we're gonna get through this together. And I know you've heard a lot of things. We're not doing any evictions. We don't wanna evict anyone now. We wanna stand shoulder to shoulder with you. Let's get through this. And you'll be able to pay the rent later if you can't pay it now. But if you can pay it now, that's best because you don't want to be in a position where you go into debt and then have to dig your way out. What you've communicated to the tenant by saying this is there's no free rent. And when you ask at the end of that, does that make sense to you? And the tenant says, well, I thought I didn't have to pay the rent. Good. Now you have a chance to explain it. If the tenant says, yeah, no, I know that makes sense. Are you able to pay the rent? Now, this assumes they didn't pay the rent when it was due, so you came to them a day or two later and you, you said this, so are you able to pay the rent? No, I'm not. Yes, I am, but I'm afraid. I can pay half, but not all. And if it's anything less than payment in full, if it's half or if it's none, and if it's I don't have the money, or if it's um, I'm, I have the money, but I'm afraid, then the answer is no problem. That's what we'll do. And I'll check with you in two more weeks. Be sure to return my calls and accept my calls because as long as we're communicating, I'll be able to work with you. And this, of course, is only temporary. This isn't gonna last forever. If you live here because you want to, you live here because we want you to, and we want you to be happy in our community. We want you to be a resident of our community. And so we'll work with you. As long as we stay in communication, it'll all work out fine. So. That's what you do then. The confirmation that you do would be a writing, and the way you would do it is you'd send an email. And the email says, again, glad to hear you're doing well, or sorry to hear you're not doing well. We will get through this, we'll all get through this together. This is a temporary situation. And then you confirm what was agreed. You have paid the rent in full, thank you. We'll see how you're doing on May 1st. Or You've paid half the rent. I'll check with you in a couple of weeks to see how you're doing. Or you've indicated that you've lost your job. You have no money to pay the rent, in which case we'll check with you in two weeks and see how you're doing. And you keep in communication in this way. And the result of this 
is that you reinforce the idea that your tenants matter to you and that their happiness matters to you. And you reinforce the idea that you're a good person because business, when conducted well, good business is always moral and it's always ethical. And if it isn't moral or it isn't ethical, then it isn't good business. And so some of the comments we've heard from some landlords who say, I just want to evict these people, that's not, being, that's, not, that's not doing the human thing correctly, and the courts won't support it, and it'll be nothing but trouble. Now, aside of the rent, I mean, is this a, a tenant's free playground where now they can move people in that weren't on the lease and there's not much about, about it that you can do during this time? They can have a pet when you have a no pet policy. Um, you know, if, if tenants do these types of uh, things, what is a landlord to do if the courts are saying, no, that's not a criminal activity thing, so we won't hear your case right now? A breach of the lease is still a breach of the lease, no matter what. And so where there's a breach of the lease, the courts will still act. Now, they're not going to act on a minor thing because we're in unusual times right now. So if the tenant is parking uh, over the line in the parking space and you evict them for that, you, you're going to lose. But if the tenant is laying waste to the property, or if the tenant is breaching the lease in some material way, or if the tenant is disturbing other tenants, if they're doing something that's in violation of the lease, the courts will steer, still hear that. But it's got to pass the smell test. Courts look to and promote good faith behavior according to reasonable standards. And as a consequence, the courts are going to look and see, is this really legitimate? Is this a problem? In which case we'll evict. Or is this just a landlord trying to get rid of someone who's otherwise not paying rent? In which case you'll lose. Now, okay, so landlords' hands are tied. And during this process, if we're talking about non-payment of rent, regardless if a tenant was impacted by COVID-19 or not, by the coronavirus, what should a landlord do in terms of a paper trail? So I understand if they give a three-day notice, it's not going to really go anywhere. But should they still execute a three-day notice so that if and when um, this moratorium is lifted, they'll have proper documentation when they do enter the courthouse? There should be no three-day notices to pay rent or quit. There should be no angry letters. There should be no angry emails. There should be no angry statements. This is a time when your tenants expect support, and if you are remembered in this crisis by your tenants as being harsh or unkind or impatient or cruel or threatening or intimidating, there'll be prices to pay down the road because you'll have spoiled your relationship with your customers, and your tenants are your customers, and they expect to be treated like customers, and you should treat them as customers. So the only written confirmation is the email that I mentioned earlier, where you confirm what the agreement is and you, you fold in front of it and in back of it, well wishes and expressions of human concern. And then you memorialize your agreement in between and affirm that you'll be calling them in two more weeks. Now, for those owners who want to work with the tenants, can they, will it bite them later? And the reason why I ask is this, uh, during the webinar that we hosted, I mentioned that for my personal units, I was going to be offering my tenants a 20% reduction in rent for the month of April. The 20% uh, was forgiven. It's not something I put on the back end, so long as they pay me the 80%. But I, not, I did not give it to uh, all my tenants. I was selective. Is there a danger in, if you own multiple locations or even just at one property that has multiple families, multiple units, in not giving the same consideration to all tenants? Well, the first thing is, if you want to give a rebate, if you want to give away money, and you want to do it as a discount and a forgiveness, it's your money and you can do that and it's generous. As a business proposition, what you have to decide is whether that's a good idea on all things considered. And that's everything from your own morality and your sense of charity, if, if this is where you want to give charity, all the way over to business considerations of what happens later. As long as you memorialize that this is a one-time forgiveness for the specific month you're doing it, and then you do it again next month and memorialize it again, 
then I don't think you're in much danger of being caught by rent control and your new lower rent is now your new rent. I don't think there's much danger of that. As for discrimination, discrimination is either legal or illegal depending on what you're discriminating on. If you're running a steakhouse and you charge $65 for a steak, uh, you're discriminating against everybody who can't afford to pay it. That's legal. And if you're selling hamburgers for less money, uh, then everybody can get those, but some people can't afford the more expensive cut. And that's legal. And so you can always discriminate on the basis of price and you can discriminate on the basis of a lot of different things. But you can't discriminate on the basis of anything that's illegal. So race, creed, color, national origin, religion, sex, sexual preference, sexual orientation, and a whole bunch of other categories, which is which are regarded as um, which are regarded as uh, uh, suspect classifications under the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. So those you can't ever discriminate on. And so, yes, you can give to one tenant because they need money more than another. You can give to another tenant because they have six children and you realize that they have big financial burdens. You cannot give to someone because they are a member or not a member of any suspect classification. These are common sense things that everyone should know. But by all the lawsuits we see, sometimes people don't know them and do those things anyway. Now at the uh, recording of our uh, webinar here, there is a new bill that's being proposed, AB 828, I believe it is. And it, it hit my desk moments before we were scheduled to go on the air here. The gist of it being that landlords may have to give up to 25% of a reduction in rent uh, to tenants. And even if a landlord can show that there's uh, ec economic blowback for them as an owner, it also states within the bill that if an owner owns more than 10 units, it's to be assumed there is no economic hardship. Um, is, you know, with all these very, and I know this is, you just saw this yourself too. So with all these various things, well, from rent control to the governor telling us one thing or another, is this not a taking, as they call it, of property in some form? That's the very first challenge, is the constitutional prohibition against the government taking without just compensation. This is found in the Fifth Amendment uh, to the Constitution of the United States. So when the government says, look, we need this land over here to build a highway, or we need that land over there to build a school, or we're going to take this land to build a state hospital, they cannot just, the government cannot just take the property. They have to give just compensation. And this is something that's been heavily litigated and well established over the last 200 years. And so there's plenty of rule as to what just compensation means. There's plenty of rule as to what taking means. And so that's one side of it. On the other hand, there are lots of things the government does that fall under the use of the, of the police power. And the police power is the power to regulate. So when they tell you, when the government tells you that you cannot build an industrial building on your land because it's zoned residential, some people would argue that's a taking. Well, that's been held not to be a taking, but instead it's a regulation. And when someone says, no, you cannot build more than this many square feet on your lot of that many square feet, that's a regulation and it's been held to be an exercise of the police power to regulate, meaning it's not a taking, meaning there's no just compensation needed. So the question is where the government says that we are going to mandatorily reduce your rent by 25% landlord, you're going to transfer that wealth directly, personally, from that single landlord to that single tenant. The question will be, is that a taking without just compensation or is that a regulation and a proper use of the police power? I believe this law will turn out if it is passed to be several things. First, it'll be a political bombshell uh, for, for the people who pass it because there'll be a tremendous organization to resist it. Second problem will be a practical one, which is we'll create housing shortages worse than the ones we had before all of this because no one's going to want to build a building if they understand that they will later be subject to having been, to be told, not only do we have rent control for you, 
but we have rent reduction for you in our discretion. The third problem is going to be that when you take directly from one landlord and give to one tenant, that's not a taxation. A taxation, which is another exception to the taking rule, is where they tax the landlord and take the money and put it in the state fund. And then the state fund goes and builds roads or uh, builds airports, or maybe they hand out money to tenants. But where you take money from one individual, the landlord, and give it to one tenant, that tenant, that's a direct redistribution of wealth. Now we hear a lot about people talking about taxation as a redistribution of wealth, but that's not taxing me to pay you. That's taxing me to give the money to the government on the theory that somehow it's going to get back to you. And we can have philosophical debates and political debates over whether that's a good idea to begin with and whether rearrangement of wealth is a good idea to begin with. And there are people who have arguments about that. But where you're taking the money from one individual and giving it to another individual directly by a forced reduction in price where everybody else gets to set their own price, this is just going to apply to landlords. This isn't going to apply to the guy who sells hamburgers. One of the things we think we're going to see after this is that many of the small restaurants are going to be in trouble and may not come back. Larger restaurants, let's say top flight, first class, very expensive restaurants, where you might pay a hundred, let's say a hundred dollars a person for a meal. What they'll do is they'll remove a third of the tables. So you have social distancing and they'll raise the price. It'll be $150 a meal. Maybe it'll be $180 a meal. And those restaurants will carry only two thirds of the number of people they did, but those people will pay a great deal more. And those restaurants will probably be just fine. They'll probably make as much money. They don't, some people will stop going there, but they don't have room for them anyway. So they'll be able to turn out where the small restaurant around the corner in your neighborhood where you're sitting two feet from the person next to you who might cough during dinner, that restaurant can't take out a third of their tables and make it. And they typically can't raise their prices by 50 or 60% to make up for it. So they'll be out of business. So when you have a rule that says landlords have to lower their prices, does it follow that you'll have a rule that says the steakhouse has to lower its price? How about the gas station or the dry cleaner? How about the doctor? How about anyone who's doing anything. How about the person who makes more money than someone else? Should they take a cut and pay and maybe hand that to the person in their company who makes less than they do? So there's a big political problem with this, as well as the constitutional problems. And I would say that if this law is passed, there'll be a political price to pay for the people who vote for it. But more than that, this will be tied up in the courts for a long time. So just like any other horrifying proposed new law, this is going to be hotly debated and it's going to be heavily contested and thoroughly discussed, and then it's going to be thoroughly litigated. So if something like this arrives, it won't arrive tomorrow. One final point. They say if you own 10 units or more, that there's, that the, there's a presumption that there's no uh, limit, no economic uh, uh, crisis for you? Well, that depends. If you have no money owed on your property and you own nine units, do you have a worse crisis than the person who owns 11 units and has an 80% loan? Mm -hmm. And what's the dividing line between 10 and nine or 11? Why not 11? Why not 10? And then what is the standard for proving an economic crisis? You're gonna have a lot of litigation over that because one person's economic blip is another person's economic crisis. This will be a lawyer's field day. The lawyers are the ones who will make the most money from this. It is probably not going to save tenants much money, if any at all. Now my staff on average probably speaks to say 100 landlords a week, let's say on average. So for the month of April, what we found is rent collection was better than most assumed it was going to be. I would say from the conversations we've had with landlords, it's as high as say 98% were able to collect 
uh, 100% of their rent roll. But also tenants were still working uh, come the end of March and then the stay at home order came. So May, you know, everyone has their eyes on May, what's gonna happen with May rent collection? Now for a lot of these landlords, many of them own say one five unit property, one eight unit property, uh, mom and pop as they're uh, known in the marketplace. And they're looking at all these uh, different orders that are being placed by the government, the, the, the state. And they're saying, look, if my rents don't show up on May and I do have a loan and I now it becomes a balancing act of trying to take my mortgage, what am I to do? I can't demand that the tenants pay me my rent, but the lenders are demanding that I pay them the mortgage. What, what advice would you have to share with these people? So first of all, your experience is similar to ours. For our 2,200 apartment units in four states, we found that the typical uh, average by April the 6th of collection was about 90.3%, and that by April the, uh, by April the uh, 14th, it was around 98% on average, so that's great. The conversations we've had internally is April might turn out to be the easy month, because it is in May and July and November, and is there a second wave of the virus? And how does the reopening work? And what does the government do? And what do businesses do? But most importantly, what do consumers do? And so we are not confident that April is representative of what's going to happen next. And so I think extreme caution should be used. What one of the things that needs to be decided is if you're making distributions to your investors or if you're taking money out, you might want to leave it in there in reserve because May might not be as good as April. Second thing is if you're paying your payments, you want to keep paying your payments if you possibly can because just like no evictions doesn't mean no rent, no foreclosures doesn't mean you don't have to pay the payments. And the idea of adding them onto the back end of the lease, or the back end of the loan, which is what we're hearing a lot of what's going to happen, that's really expensive. When you do the math of what happens when you extend out your loan and you tack principal on the end, so you're paying interest on interest, the result of that ends up being prohibitively expensive. So you wanna pay the payments if you possibly can. The only thing you can do to collect the rent are the things I suggested before, which is cash in on the fact that you have been a good landlord, that you've repaired things properly and promptly, that you haven't made uh, taken shortcuts that's caused your tenants not to like you, or worse, not to respect you. Cash in on that by asking for their cooperation and cash in on the relationships you formed with your tenants uh, where they trust you and they like you and they know you care about them because of how you treat them all throughout the years they've been with you. If that isn't what you've done, and if you don't have those reserves to call on, there aren't many other reserves to call on because you can't evict them, and you don't want to threaten them, and you don't want to be harsh or rude with them or impatient with them, even if you yourself are frightened. You want to be patient, and you want to remember that you're speaking on the air live and for the record. You should always assume whenever you are talking to a tenant that they have one of these in their uh, pocket and that it's recording. You should always assume you're speaking for the record. What's that you say? It's illegal to do that? Sure, but people do it all the time. So bear in mind that you're speaking for the record when you talk to your tenants. You can't put pressure on them. We've seen already stories of landlords who've been way out of line in their collection attempts. So now what happens if you get to the place where you can't collect the rent for one reason or another due to COVID, and you can't pay your payments. Well, now you need to do exactly what you would do on an airplane in the unlikely event of a water landing, your seat cushion floats, you're gonna float in the water on your seat cushion, you're gonna not pay the payments. You wanna reach out to your lender to explain that, to figure out what your alternatives are. If you're offered a forbearance agreement to sign, you're gonna to wanna to have a lawyer look at it before you sign it so you understand what the implications are. You're gonna to wanna to have your CPA do the math for you to tell you what it's gonna cost. And then you wanna figure out whether you want to, in essence, borrow more money from your lender by not paying the payment, 
or whether instead you're going to try to borrow money from someone else who might make you a less expensive loan. That's the final thing you do before you stop paying payments. If you cannot borrow other money and you don't have other resources and you have no choice, then you have to stop paying the payments because you have no choice. But it would be my last choice. I'm gonna borrow money from friends and family and other banks and do all sorts of things that are less expensive before I'm gonna borrow more money by my, from my lender. Because when you force someone to lend you money, whether you're a tenant forcing a landlord or you're a borrower forcing a lender to lend you money, that never ends well. It's not going to be pleasant. It will be very complicated. The politics surrounding this are gonna change and change and then they're going to change again. So you cannot count on what anything you're hearing about what law might protect or you or what law might prevent something from happening. It's subject to change any minute. Now, the practicality of running our buildings day to day. So, you know, landlords are just like the tenants. They're having to, when they go to the grocery store, they're having to compete that still till now, at least here locally to us, uh, there's not, it's slim pickings on some of the staple items. You know, they're, they're going through life um, just like everyone else. Uh, you know, there's no toilet paper. For whatever odd reason, there was a run on toilet paper to fight a uh, respiratory infection, which is baffling to me, but people did that. And so they're saying, okay, well, if I still have to run the day-to-day, -day, what happens if I get a vacant unit? Should I show the vacant unit? Should I rent the vacant unit when there's no uh, evictions allowed? Should I take more deposit up front? Should I require people looking at the unit? Uh, you know, not more than one person being in the unit at any time. What's your suggestion when dealing with a vacant unit? So if you've got a vacant unit, you can show the vacant unit. You're gonna use social distancing and all the other things that you would expect. So what you're going to do is open the door to the unit. You're gonna go in and open the interior doors, open the closet doors, open things so people don't have to touch them. You're gonna to suggest to people that they don't touch anything in the unit. And you stay outside while they're in. If they need help because they want you to open a kitchen cabinet that hadn't been opened, you can walk in, ask them to stand over there while you're moving over here, stay six feet away. Of course, you're wearing a mask. And of course, you hope they're wearing a mask. And you're offering perhaps even hand sanitizer to them if you've got a bottle of it in your pocket uh, when they leave or even before they enter or both. I think both. Um, and you show them the unit. And so if they're together, if those two people are people who are sheltering in place together, they can move together through the unit and otherwise you'd have people wait outside. But yes, you can show a unit. And no, you don't wanna to take toilet paper as payment for rent. <laughs> what about vendors? Uh, you typically have your pest control or some other similar type of service come through monthly. Uh, can you ask that the tenants open their units at this time? Yes. For emergencies, you certainly can. And if there are emergencies, you do whatever you need to do. You do it again carefully with social distancing and proper practices. Um, but, but for emergencies, yes. For routine things, no. So if the pest control person is supposed to come out every 30 days and do an interior, that's something where you would say to the tenant, would you like the pest control person to come in, and if you would, we'll have them. If the person, if the tenant says no, then if there's no pressing problem, you don't do it, and you say to the tenant, you need to let me know if you want the pest person to come out, and I'll have them come out. And then you send an email to the tenant saying, just confirming our conversation of today at 4.07 p.m., uh, I offered to have the pest control person come in. You said you'd prefer not. I told you no problem that if you want the pest control person, reach out and we'll have them come out. Uh, I'll check with you again in 30 days to see if you'd like the pest control person out. This is, this is the simplest, most straightforward way to do it. There's a thread running through everything I'm saying, which is communicate and be nice. If you communicate and you're nice, things will work much better. Now, what happens when the inevitable lawsuit comes along that the landlord gets blamed for the spread of the virus because you have a common area, either laundry room, barbecue pit, somehow the tenant alleges uh, you should have done more as a landlord to prevent the spreading of the virus. Should you close your laundry room? Should you close common amenities? What, 
what does a landlord do there? So when you find out that one of your tenants has COVID, what you should do is tell them to follow the directions of their doctor and follow the directions of the government. And that's what you should tell all your tenants. You are not the boss. You are not the parent. You are not the police. You are just the landlord, which means your job is to provide habitable premises. And that's your job. And so your job isn't to give medical advice, legal advice, government advice, health advice. What you would want to do is say to the person who has said they have COVID is you should say to them, you should probably tell that to the other tenants in the building. And you should send a confirming email to that person just saying that you've suggested that. Beyond that, it's not your responsibility. And here's why I'm not too worried about the lawsuits that will come out of this. And I'm sure there'll be some that will because there are always lawyers who will sue anyone for anything. There's going to be an allegation. And the allegation is that tenant B got COVID because tenant A had COVID and you, the landlord, didn't tell tenant B that tenant A had COVID. And then the question is, is that what happened? How do you prove if you're tenant B and their lawyer, how do you prove that that's where they got COVID? And how do you prove, because if they were social distancing, then how would that happen? If they weren't, then who, why is that your fault? And, and so it's going to be very difficult for anyone in any lawsuit to prove that someone caused them COVID, especially when this is apparently highly transmissible. And if you choose to, because I've had this question a few times now, if you choose to close the laundry room, since that was an amenity that you offered when you rented the unit, but if you choose to close it for a period of time, do you see any issue with that? Yes. Uh, I, I'm not in favor of closing the laundry room. I'm in favor of putting a sign up saying that I understand that there are people in the building who may have been confirmed for having COVID. Please use caution when using the laundry room. And then I would say uh, you can use practices to sanitize surfaces. You can do things like that. Uh, beyond that, closing the laundry room itself, I don't think is a good idea. Now, there's a couple competing issues here, if you will, or, or for a landlord to make sense of, of everything that's taken place in the last month now. As I mentioned earlier, Gavin Newsom initially came out and said, okay, if a tenant can prove that they have been adversely affected by uh, the coronavirus, COVID, then they have six months of which to repay any rent that they miss. And that's where we were for about two weeks. Then again, last week they say, well, regardless, there's gonna be no evictions anyhow. Well, when the no eviction piece component goes away and now you can evict, if you will, what is it, number one, I guess, can a landlord ask for proof that the tenant uh, was affected by the coronavirus? Who is gonna be the investigating body that says, yes, this proof passes the smell test? Does a landlord do any of that or they just, move forward with a, uh, you know, a eviction proceeding and let the courts handle that component of it. So first, the example you just gave is an example of what I was saying earlier, that this is changing every hour. So the government said this, and then later they said that, and later they're going to say something else. Mm -hmm. Because this is going to be a continuously revising situation. We've lived all of our lives with most of these things being static. They are fixed in place. They're not moving. Now, everything is moving. Before, we would make movable decisions within a fixed structure. Now, we're making movable decisions within a moving structure. And so, to try now to decide what someone's going to do months from now, when a stay is lifted, whatever that means, and when there's a 90-day halt, and then someone else has, says there's another rule that says six months, there's no way to know now what we're going to do then. So here's the general rule. The general rule is stay in touch with your tenants and negotiate, as I've described before, collect what you can nicely. And then as the situation changes, we'll, I'm sure, Chris, you and I will do more of these and we'll have much clearer answers as to what to do then. For now, there's nothing you can do and nothing anyone should do. I've seen some lawyers saying, oh, you should absolutely give three-day notices. That's wrong advice. 
because they serve no purpose except to antagonize the tenant and make a paper trail so that later when a judge looks at it, you don't look like a very good human. And that counts with judges because courts look to and promote good faith behavior according to reasonable standards. And someone who acts in good faith is gonna get a better shake from a judge where a case is on the bubble than when the judge looks and says, you know what, I don't feel like helping this landlord at all. I think we've covered as much as we know about the COVID and tenant evictions up to this point. And so I want to transition now to the questions that were submitted the day of the live webinar. For those of you who have never had the opportunity to attend one of our educational luncheons, uh, aside of each of our um, guests who present based upon their field, for example, Steven Spear, he's definitely become the crowd favorite over the years. He speaks to real estate law, while we have somebody like Bruce Norris who speaks to market forecasting. Once that component of the event is done, we open the event for questions from the entire audience. And so these questions that we're gonna go through now were actually submitted um, through that platform. Somewhat going back to COVID, but this is because things were just developing at the time, but the tenant or the landlord is asking, okay, before the whole crisis erupted, they had a tenant who was already behind on rent. They were pursuing an eviction. Now they're saying no evictions. The court won't hear their case. What do you do with an issue that was prior to all of this? Unfortunately, you wait. There are going to be no evictions for non-payment of rent, and the ones that are working their way through the system are on hold as well. Many of the courtrooms are just closed. Some of the courthouses are just closed. Judges are only taking emergency measures for emergencies like temporary restraining orders and injunctions and temporary protective orders. They are not doing routine processing, so you wait. There really is no other alternative. If you purchase a property and the tenant and landlord sign an estoppel saying there's a specific number of people in the unit, you close escrow, come to find out there's somebody else living in the unit that's not on the estoppel. Is that grounds to immediately evict and or can you choose to increase the rent if, that ten if you choose to accept the tenant, can you raise the rent given the rent control laws? I'm gonna give you a legal answer. I'm gonna give you a practical answer. The legal answer is you could probably move to evict. And so what you would do is demand that that person leave. And if they don't, you would then start an eviction on the basis of a breach of the lease. And so that would be the technical answer. You, the, the real world answer is, no, of course you don't wanna do that. What you wanna do is you wanna go and greet the a tenant and a very poor way of saying hello is to start by saying to them, what's wrong with you? You lied on the tenant estoppel certificate. So the way I would do it instead is you go to the new tenant and you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm the new landlord and it's a shame we're meeting under these difficult circumstances and you're talking to them by phone or by visual media over the internet and you say, but I wanted to welcome you to the building. And because we are new to the building, I want to know from you, are there any things that you, is there anything that you need in order to uh, have the property operate properly? We owe you a habitable premise. Is, your, is everything working? Are you have any problems? Do you need anything repaired? And then you have that entire conversation. And the answer might be no, or it might be, yeah, there are five things I've been asking your seller for, or whatever they say. And you go through that. And if they say, yeah, you know, the, this doesn't work and that doesn't work, you say, well, I'm happy to send someone in if I can get someone to go in. Would you like to do that now? Or would you prefer to wait till later until this has subsided? And then once you reach all those agreements, you confirm them in writing in an email saying you've identified this or you've told me there are no problems or whatever it would be. Then in that same conversation, you say, I'm, I have one question on the estoppel certificate. It did not tell us that Bill is living there, but apparently Bill is living there with you. And so my question is, was this just an oversight or is Bill just a visitor? Can you tell me more about Bill? And the tenant might say, uh, oh yeah, Bill's been here for a week, but he's leaving tomorrow. Or they might say, no, Bill was here. Didn't we write that down? Or they might say, it's none of your business. I can have anyone live here who I want. 
And depending on what they say, that's where you know you have the beginnings or the ends of a good relationship. And if you have spent enough time and made enough emotional deposits in the bank with that tenant in that initial conversation, then that part of the conversation will go well. Generally, I don't think it's a good idea to say hello to a tenant by saying you gotta move someone out or you'll, or you'll evict them. And so that brings us to the question of whether you should negotiate for higher rent. I don't think in this environment it's a good idea. You have absolutely no leverage to do that except the threat to evict. So I would rather see you either let go of the issue completely or ask Bill to move out or ask the whole tenant if they'd like to move out, if you have to. But the last thing I want to do is start looking like I'm trying to take advantage of something that went wrong to try to raise the rent. It's a very poor way to say hello. Let's say you've given your tenants multiple ways of which they can pay the rent. They can either mail the rent to a PO box that you have, or they can use some type of uh, smartphone application. In either event, if the rent shows up after the due date, let's start first with the direct deposit feature. If you're unable to stop the deposit, so the you know the rent was late uh, and now it's the second, you posted a three-day notice to pay or quit, they make the automatic deposit on the third or fourth. So now have you taken constructive receipt of that rent, must you hold on to that rent? How do you proceed if you would rather uh, go forward with an eviction um, as opposed to uh, having them stay? So two separate sets of circumstances. The first is the normal thing. They give you a check or they mail you a check or they put a check in a box or they mail a check to a location and somehow they haven't and the rent is late and you serve a notice to pay rent or quit. And you don't want them to stay, you want them to leave. and so what you have to do is refuse or return any payment that they make. So if they make a payment during the, after the three days, if they make the payment during the three days, they pay the rent. But on the fourth or later, if they give you a check, mail you a check, put a check in the box, deposit, uh, it, it, stick a check into your, your post office box or whatever they do, you would return that check with a cover letter saying it's late and we're not accepting it and we're returning it and you will have written void across the check. Void, V-O-I-D at a diagonal across the check when you send it back and say, we're, we're asking you to leave, we're gonna be evicting you soon. And again, this is not in the COVID environment, this is in the normal environment. And uh, so you refuse it. The second possibility is that you have an automatic account where they can just stick money in. They pay through Venmo or they pay through some other online system and that's how they pay. So you give the three day notice, the three days pass, it's too late. And then when it's too late, they make a deposit. You're out of luck. You have to start over. So if you use one of these systems where someone can make a deposit in your account, they aren't handing you a check that you have to deposit, but they're just making a deposit in your account. When that happens, when, you, when you're getting ready to give them a three-day notice, you have to disable that account so they can't put money in. Some systems allow for that, others don't. If you have one that doesn't, get a new system because you need a system that will stop the money from going in if you wanna be able viably to throw someone out on a three day notice to pay rent or quit. And if they went the avenue of mailing the check to your PO box and they mailed the rent three days prior to the due date, but for whatever reason, it didn't show up in your PO box on the first, it shows up on the fourth or the fifth after the three day has expired, but you can see the stamp from the post office that in fact it was mailed, you know, two, three days before the due date. What do you suggest in that situation? Payment is made when payment is received. And so someone who mails takes the risk that the mail may not deliver on time. And if the mail is late, the mail is late. So the advice I would give to a tenant is if you're gonna to try to pay the rent by mail, you better mail it on the 25th of the month so it's there by the first of the next month. And you probably better find out if it got there by calling the landlord and asking. 
And if you've gotten the three day notice, you better deliver it some other way so that you know you have the day, you have you have proof of what day the money was received. So it's when the check is actually received and provided by the way the check doesn't bounce. If the check is received late because the mail was late, that's on the tenant because the landlord, the lease says the tenant, the, the, the tenant must pay the rent by such and such a date and pay doesn't mean it's in the mail. Now, of course, you know, many things will change over the coming months. Uh, assumably the coronavirus will simmer down and eventually go away. Eventually the courts will reopen and hear your eviction case. But one thing that is here to stay, at least as we know it, is rent control. And rent control really was the buzzword uh, come the first of this year because the new law went into effect. And so that's what I've been uh, sharing with our clients is that many of these things will pass, but rent control will unfortunately still be here when life does return to normal. And to, and we've been telling our clients, okay, how do you maximize your properties, take full advantage of the opportunity that's within them in terms of the cash flow? Well, under rent control, if you want to raise rents, you have to commit to do capital improvements in order to ask a tenant to leave, assuming the city they own in doesn't have um, some type of uh, legislation against that. Um, and so then you get some landlords who are saying, okay, well, substantial improvement. I'll just change the bathroom vanity to ask the tenant to leave. You know, I'll just, in other words, they're trying to uh, work the system in order to just get tenants out. What are your thoughts on, uh, that clause of the rent control law that you can't ask somebody to leave provided you do substantial improvement to the unit. The rule actually on this is clearer than some of the other issues in rent control. Again, this is a new law. And whenever you have a new law of any kind, it takes about a decade. It takes 10 years for it to work its way through the courts and all the lawsuits that'll be filed, figuring out what words mean and what they, what else they mean. And it'll take those same 10 years for the California legislature to keep modifying and amending and correcting and changing the law. And that'll happen continuously. And so in 10 years, we'll all know exactly what it means. But this piece you're asking about, Chris, is one of the, one of the ones I think are somewhat clearer, which is that when there is a permit that is required by the, by the governing authority, usually the city or the county or both, sometimes the state, where a permit is required for something to be, oh, and on occasions, federal government, rare, but on occasions. When a permit is required to be uh, pulled to do construction, that's what qualifies. So if it's something that doesn't need a permit, then that doesn't qualify. So if someone is going to plane a door or they're gonna paint the kitchen, that's not it. If you're going to replace the plumbing or do electrical work that requires that the place be vacated, then yes. So if you're going to, for example, replace uh, the electrical panel and the electrical panel is on the side yard where it doesn't disturb anybody, that's not going to be good enough. But if you're going to be replacing all the wires and the walls, you can tear the place apart, that'll be good enough. So the margin is again going to come down to courts look to and promote good faith behavior according to reasonable standards. And the judge is going to look and say, is this a legitimate remodel that really requires that this tenant move out or is this a gimmick that the landlord is using to be able to evade rent control and you can say anything you want but the judge will decide and when the judge decides that'll be the decision and if you've ever had an argument with someone over government politics or religion you know that about the time you're looking at that person and thinking, wow, this person's a little whacked out, and they're looking at you thinking, wow, you're a little bit whacked out, those same people sometimes become judges. So you don't know what the decision is going to be, but you can't count on the fact that because you think it's reasonable that the judge will. There I suggest that you take the guidance of your lawyer your lawyer has much more experience in knowing what judges and juries and arbitrators will do and can probably make better predictions for you so you can make judgments uh, based upon them.
Now, of the taping of this webinar, today's April 15th, and Governor Gavin Newsom yesterday came out and laid out five or six points of which he's going to use in, to determine how to lift the stay-at-home order. And for anyone who's reviewed them, they're very vague. I'd rather he would have just said, I'm not sure, I'm not qualified to say yet, I'll be back with you, instead of giving these vague points. So we're probably gonna be here for a little while longer. And with that in mind, you know, I, you know, when I'm talking about investments with clients, I talk about three pillars of the financial legacy, maximizing their properties, growing their portfolio, preparing for tomorrow. Maximize, grow, and prepare. So as we get ready to hunker down for another three, four weeks, from the personal side of things, how do people do this, Steve? How do we maximize the opportunity that we have to be at home? How do we continue to grow? And how do we prepare when, for when life returns to normal? I think uh, the first thing is be safe and follow all the rules uh, that the government is suggesting and the doctors are suggesting. And if your doctor is suggesting something in, in particular, follow those, follow those rules. I would say this also, Cherish the time that you have to do things that you don't get around to doing. A lot of times people talk about what they might do if they had the time. Well, you have the time right now to do a lot of things you might not otherwise do. Call people who you care about, who the ones who you think, wow, haven't talked to that person in years. It would be really neat to talk to them, but you never have time. Well, now not only do you have time, they probably have time. So this would be a good time to phone a friend maybe five or six of them a day, and have conversation with them. You wanna make sure that you're meeting the three fundamentals of life and of good mental and physical health, and those would be making sure you're getting enough sleep and the right kind of sleep, and make sure you're eating the way you want, and make sure you're exercising. And if you live in California, you have an advantage of being able to walk outside and let, it, let the sun shine on you and get some fresh air staying within the rules and regulations of what you can do when you walk outside, try that and do that. And when you're doing all of this, focus not just on all the things that are wrong, you gotta think about some of those at some point, but think about all the things that aren't going wrong and the fact that you probably have electricity and you probably have enough food in most cases and you have Right now, there are no civil disturbances. There are a lot of things that could be a lot worse in circumstances such as this. And I think if we're appreciative and we count those blessings and count all those things that are going right, in addition to being well aware and careful about the things that are going wrong, I think we'll all do a lot better. Steve, uh, should our viewers choose to uh, counsel with you, they need uh, a lawyer to turn to, they need questions to answer? Because I know you do things just as simple as taking one question and, and billing just on the one question. You don't demand a one hour consultation. Where do they find you? How can they contact you? The way it works is if you'd like to get a hold of us, take a look at practicallawyer.com. That's practicallawyer.com. And you can send me an email if you want. My email address, steve at practicallawyer.com, Steve, that's S-T-E-V-E, -E, Steve, at practicallawyer.com. We do charge for consultations, and what we do is we charge a minimum of a one-hour charge for a consultation, but if we don't use that whole hour, then we uh, will reserve that time for you for future questions. If you open an account, then we immediately begin charging in tenth of an hour increments, in other words, six minutes or less, and we have lots of people who take who who have an open account. Some of them we hear from twice a week and twice a day, and others we might not hear from but once a year. So you can do that as well. Again, Steve at practicallawyer.com. Steve, thank you for your time with us today. We appreciate it. You've given much insight. I know that uh, with the information you've shared, it gives the investors a firmer footing to navigate all the changes that have taken place over the last few weeks. I wish you well. I uh, wish that you and your family stay safe. Chris, I hope that you and your wife and your seven children are safe and happy in one house together. I know that's got to be an extraordinary experience. I want to thank you, Chris, for the contribution you make 
to the people of California as the apartment dealer. Your expertise in multifamily is deep and it's broad and your advice is sound. And I think the service that you render is deeply valuable. Anyone who is thinking about finding and buying or selling or better yet exchanging from one set of multifamily units to another, Chris German is a guy to use. Thank you. I thank you. Thank you for that, Steve. And uh, yes, at home with my wife and seven kids, it is not for the weak. I will tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We will talk to you soon. Be well.